let um, Laura and Michael uh, just further introduce themselves a little bit and talk about the, the asset class area that they will be focusing in on their answers on. So Todd is going to talk kind of about the general markets with kind of a focus on, on the equity markets in particular. And then our other two guests here are kind of dialing in on some of our um, alternatives. So uh, Laura, if you don't want to start. Absolutely, thanks. I'm gonna, assume, yep, green light, green means go. Okay, um, well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so as Todd outlined, I've spent a lot of time in the industry and you know, really unpack what private credit means to me. There is a lot of terminology that's, that's used, and I'll, I'll help sort of outline that. Um, private credit really predominantly is um, sort of oriented to what we call senior secure middle market direct lending. So that's a, that's a lot to unpack there. But what we're really doing and what the heart of private credit is, is that we are extending financing to small to medium sized businesses um, we're providing effectively private loans. And so within our asset class, you know, why can't these businesses that we're providing capital to, why can't they just simply walk into a bank and get the loan that they need? And the reason is that post the global financial crisis or the great financial crisis, a lot of regulation came through our market that effectively made it very punitive for banks to really provide capital in this space. And so post the global financial crisis, you really had a lot of managers enter this space because why? These businesses have a need to exist. They're recession resilient, they have strong business models, and they have a continued need for financing. So where banks, you know, effectively, it's not that they cannot provide the financing, it's that they really choose not to, really retrenched from the space. And so when I think about when we're providing capital to these businesses, they truly represent the real economy. These are goods, products, and services that are developed, distributed in our own backyards. So they're generally companies that are multi-generational. They're usually founder and owner operated, and they have a capital need. What is that capital need for? It is typically because they're expanding. They're pushing out to another geography. They're perhaps trying to buy a competitor. So that's what they're really, why they're seeking the financing. And so why has there been just so much interest in this asset class? And it's because of how it's structured. So first and foremost, these loans are predominantly senior in a business's capital structure. So that means in the event that a business gets into some form of challenge or distress, which is very rare, but when it does happen, they're senior in the capital structure and they have a first lien right to the assets of the borrower. The next component is that those loans are backed by the assets of the borrower. And last not in, but not least is that these, these instruments, because they're privately held, they do not trade, they're illiquid, they're not susceptible to the volatility that, is, that takes place in the marketplace and or are uncorrelated to other asset classes. So investors have been very attracted to this space, the private credit space, because of all those attributes of the asset class, but importantly, also the yield profile that they exhibit, which are generally much higher than what you can find in the public credit markets. Over to you. Well, thank you all uh, for the opportunity to be here today and, and speak with you. Um, as Todd mentioned, uh, I've been an investor with KKR for around 12 years, uh, and, and during that time, uh, I've really invested across the different asset classes that KKR uh, offers. So, um, KKR has been in this game for 47 years, uh, initially as a private equity uh, focused firm, and then over the over the last uh, decade or, or almost two decades now, we've really broadened out uh, into uh, all the different alternative investment strategies: infrastructure, real estate, uh, credit, um, and uh, during during my time. Um, uh, our firm's been almost entirely focused on ins institutional investors, so endowments, insurance companies, uh, and uh, we've developed 
uh, over the last decade what's uh, one of the best real estate businesses on the street. Um, and we, we say that for really two reasons. We think one of the key differentiators we have uh, is we have a full integration between our equity and credit business. We don't look at real estate uh, as, a, uh, as, a, uh, as an equity opportunity or a credit opportunity like, like many firms do. Um, equity is a risk, uh, so real estate is a risk, and at different times in the cycle, there's going to be there's, there's different ways to play it. Whether that's in, at the top of the capital structure, uh, in the credit position, or, or at the bottom of the capital uh, capital structure in an equity position. Um, one of the, the the projects I took on, I think nearly four and a half years ago, was the development um, of the product we call KKR Real Estate uh, Select Trust, or easier to call it Crest, as we as we refer to it. And, Really, the objective of that fund was to bring our real estate strategies and package them in a way that we could offer them to individual investors. Commercial real estate is a very hard asset class to get uh, direct exposure to. There's a lot of transaction friction. Building up a divorce, diversified portfolio is extremely hard. Uh, and when you layer on capabilities like credit, you need a very deep uh, team of originators. You need a macro team that's really informing uh, the top-down decisions, and it, it, it's a very challenging uh, strategy where you really need to pick your spots. So um, I work uh, today almost exclusively on, on Crest, um, and, and uh, it, 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 it was KKR is really it's their first product um, targeted to the individual investors rather than institutional investors, uh, and it's, it's, it's what it delivers is income-oriented uh, exposure to real estate uh, in a wrapper that, that is a, a really a democratized uh, fund. Great, thank you. So to get started, um, I would like to just get everyone's kind of general sentiment on the, um, the US economy and the kind of broader markets. So Todd, do you want to start us off? Uh, sure. Uh, first, I'm going to unpack what they said because it was really good. but. Laura's company gives money to people who normally can't get a bank loan. And it's not because they don't get good credit, it's just because the banks won't want the money anymore for that space, especially after the financial crisis. Um, and then take the other. Uh, Michael essentially is private real estate, so it's not publicly traded, it's privately traded, which makes it more stable and usually a better uh, real estate play than publicly traded REITs are. So it means that the value doesn't go up and down as much and you get paid use a little bit more than you do in a publicly traded REIT. So both of those, most of you all own those assets, which is why we invited them. And um, even though it sounds really complicated, it's really not. It, well, it is, but it's really easy to understand if you, if you look at it just that way. So, so the markets right now, <clears throat> I think we're in kind of a precarious time um, for several reasons. One, the Federal Reserve is uh, still probably increasing interest rates. Um, we're, there's, a, there's always a, a debate in the media whether the Fed is going to increase rates or in, in this next employment report or this next inflation report is going to make a determination. And this Fed governor and that Fed governor has said that they're, they're hawkish or they're a dove on interest rates. Um, we think that next week the Fed will probably, uh, or two weeks from now, the Fed will probably increase rates again. Um, and the reason for that is if they pause, that sends a signal to the market that they're getting ready to change. So if they think they continue to need to raise interest rates um, to control inflation, they probably will raise again next week. And the thought is they may raise again in July. Um, what you're, I heard it, an interesting uh, comment on CNBC this morning by one of the, the people that was a guest speaker, and he said, it's kind of like we're, you're at a party and the last drink is usually what throws you over the edge. And so that's what we're worried about with the Fed, that the last interest rate uh, hike will cause the market to turn down or turn extremely soft and have a hard landing. So that what we do see right now, in addition to the Fed raising interest rates, is they're shrinking the balance sheet and they're pulling money back out of the money market. And then after the banking crisis, they told banks not to lend, which is obviously good for, um, for Laura's situation, because if the banks aren't lending, um, that's causing a problem. A lot of the smaller regional banks are having issues. Um, our parent, our custodian was in the media for that, and we have got a lot of questions about that. Banks are, have been flush with cash, meaning they have money, more money than they need to loan out. And the, what is happening now is 
since the banks aren't paying anything on that cash because they can't really lend it and they can't make any money on it, it's just been sitting there and they're paying an FTIC insurance premium on it, people are pulling that money out of the bank and going to money markets. So that's essentially what effectively caused uh, Silicon Valley Bank to fail, was all this money was being pulled off of the, um, out of the bank to go into money markets which pay the higher uh, yield. We also see the consumer slowing down uh, for two reasons. One, because things cost more and people are, are afraid uh, to spend money on things. People are still traveling and are still buying retail stuff, but the big ticket stuff, refrigerators, uh, houses, those types of things, they are really pulled back on. Home Depot's earnings report was not great because a lot of the big ticket items, people aren't buying, they're buying the lower uh, types of stuff. So inflation is obviously, um, as I alluded to, the Fed's probably going to increase rates. It's still a problem where last number was 4.9. I think uh, the inflation number for next month comes out week after next. If that print is still well above in the 4% range, inflation has come down year over year from 9.1 to 4.9, but that's still 3% of the target rate. So um, you have the Fed tightening the vice on the economy. The consumer is starting to slow down on spending. Uh, the one thing that is uh, mysterious, which we think is a demographic issue, not really an economic issue, is the jobs market. People, the one thing that is missing that has not kicked the economy into recession or has not really slowed the economy down is people are not afraid of losing their jobs right now. Um, there's still about, I saw in the news, there was 10.1 million unfilled jobs, and we think that is because of demographics, not because of the economy. Um, just simple demographics are, <clears throat> there's about 110 million people over 50. There's about 82 million people between 18 and 49. And there's about 124 million people in America that are under 18. So if you think about that, the ma majority of the workforce is the smallest sector of the population right now. And as baby boomers retire, and as people, uh, I'm 50, 56 this year, as we move up into those positions or move even into retirement ourselves, there's not enough of Lexi's and Kayla's and Emmett's and uh, Taylor's and uh, to fill in the role of those people as we move on. So it's created a major shortage of uh, labor in this country. We've not educated tradespeople, so we have a major shortage of tradespeople as well in this country right now. So. That has supported the market and kept us from having this hard landing because people are not afraid of losing their jobs and the job market is still really strong. So, so before Laura and Michael answer, I just want to say that when we invite our, our partners to, to join us, we don't ask them to sing necessarily from the, the same hymn book that we do. So throughout the course of our conversation today, you may hear other points of view that you know maybe be different than what we've communicated in our meetings with you. Um, but that's one of the reasons that we're independent is that we can go out and get multiple different points of view um, to help us formulate our opinion on how we manage your money. So just wanted to add that into the discussion. Um, so Laura or Michael, uh, would you like to kind of share your all's thoughts on the economy right now? I think Lexi's saying that she wants a contrarian view. Um, <laughs> no, no, I so want you to for, answer how yeah, you like. Uh, right, so to, to keep things uh, interesting. Um, all right, so we have what we call the, the Nuveen house view. Um, and sort of our, our house view is that we think that the, the Fed is on pause, um, which is slightly contrarian to, um, to, to Todd's view. And, um, so Fed is on pause in both directions actually. So both on hikes and cuts, and that's for this year. However, if we look at the Fed fund futures, um, they're pointing to you know, perhaps a cut in December um, and another two cuts in, in January. So our, our, our view is even con contrarian to what the Fed Fund's future surveys are. Um, and so when I think about, and, I, and, and all of Todd's points around and what's actually happening on the ground in terms of consumer spending and, and jobs spot on, um, I think that, I, I think of things like you're swimming in an ocean and every time that you go to like pick your head up to catch a catch some air, take a breath, another wave sort of just like hits you in the face. And and I think about you know all of 2022 
um, that really we had all the macro and, and geopolitical uncertainty around Russia and Ukraine. We didn't know what the Fed was gonna do. They were, you know, raising rates at an incredible pace. Um, and then we get to this year, and you know, we, we talked about some of the recent banking um, turmoil, and that was that other wave that sort of hit us again in the face in March of, of 23. And so my concerns around all that and the Fed and their uncertainty is it's causing a slowdown in capital formation, and that's bad for everyone. Um, what does like, capital formation mean to me? It means just new transactions happening in market. Right? Whether that's a, a, a company deciding whether or not they want to go public or it's in our market where we talked about that generational transfer of wealth where you know, many folks are reaching a point where like, well, I'm ready to retire. But maybe now they're on sort of wait and see mode as to when they might want to sell their business. So, um, you know, I think about for our asset class, the, it is a floating rate debt instrument. Um, we have certainly, as, as all of us here, as investors in the asset class, we have certainly benefited from the Fed increasing rates. Um, call it 10 times over the last 14 months. And why is that? Why did we all benefit? We benefited because as the Fed increases interest rates, our asset class naturally floats along with it or concurrently with, with the Fed funds rate. And so that hits our, all of our accounts in the form of a distribution yield. So we're, we're very, you know, the Fed action is as rapid as it was and, and some of the uncertainty that they, I think that they've created in the marketplace. We have benefited from it, so that's something from an income perspective that I take a little bit of, of solace in. Um, and, and so we'll see what happens for the rest of the year. Yeah. Morning. I think from an economic standpoint, I don't think we're, we're far off. I think, uh, is the Fed going to pause? Uh, maybe, maybe not. I, I don't think we're, we're at the point we can say that, but I think we can say that you know, there's not a hundred, another 100 basis points of rise to go. It's going to be another 20, maybe 50, um, which is important to get stability. I, I agree with the comment that the market has been very, um, very bullish on the timing of when cuts will follow. Uh, our, our health view is that you know, once rates uh, pause, whether that, whichever level that's going to be, it's going to take some time uh, and to, to really tame inflation at least through to the end of the year. So I, I, we don't see any near-term cuts. Um, and the impacts of the, the rate rises, they haven't obviously fully permeated through the economy. There's going to be a slowing on consumer, there's going to be a slowing on corporate earnings. So from a pure economic standpoint, I think clearly the second half of the year is going to remain weak and, and uh, you know, we may see a mild recession. I don't think we're going to see a hard landing. Um, but I, the, the other important consideration, even with that outlook, is it a good time to invest? Uh, and the things we think about from an investing standpoint, the best vintages tend to come uh, in, in the aftermath of a shock. And 500 basis points of rate rises in a matter of months it clearly qualifies as a shock. So we, we have that. The second element we need is to gain a little bit of certainty around the outlook. Um, I think if you had asked this panel six, and myself six months ago where rates are going to peak, uh, you probably would have got an answer between four and eight or nine percent. But the reality is we, we just didn't know. I think today, I think we're probably in a 50 basis point per hand. So having that certainty of, of where the path goes is, 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 is really the, the most critical part of taking a view on the, on the future. I think as well, um, valuations have adjusted, and the the risk the risk of that hard landing, um, which would be a, a very negative event that's always hard to price. I, I think that's sufficiently low. So, so we look forward. We say, look, the economy is going to remain weak. Rates going to remain high. Um, there's a, there's a lot of the, the the change that needs to make its way through. But the opportunity set is actually pretty interesting. We, we have a, a relative level of confidence in terms of what the outlook is from here. I think valuations are reflecting uh, you know, a, lot, a lot of the downside, which puts us in a position where it could be a really interesting vintage in the second half of the year uh, to be starting to lean in more aggressively, where you really have that upside skew where the, the downside risks are starting to, uh, starting to mitigate. Thank you. Uh, this next question is for Todd. Um, so we're five months into the year, and for most of this year, the market has kind of been in this trading range. And what's really interesting is if you look at the market, uh, particularly the, 
the S&P 500 or the NASDAQ, uh, the market's very narrow. So there's about seven stocks that account for about 90% of the return. Um, so talk a little bit about what you think about that and what that historically has meant for the markets. Yeah, um, so we, uh when we have our investment meetings on uh, Monday, everybody brings things to the table that they've seen for the week and the weekend, stories and statistics, and we try to put together a mosaic of that to come up with advice for everybody and what our portfolios are going to do. And to that point, seven stocks in the S&P, essentially, as Lexi pointed out, are 90% of return in the S&P 500 this year, which is up about 9 or 10% right now. Uh, the other 493 stocks are down 45 basis points. So that is an incredibly narrow market. When you have a very narrow market like that, where just a few mega cap stocks lead the market, it typically leads to a pretty healthy correction coming up. Because you want to see a broad market step up where the majority of stocks go up, and that means the economy is doing really well. When you see just a few of the stocks going up like that, that means everybody's piling in what we call piling into the trade. They're chasing they're chasing the return. And usually, the time when everybody uh, capitulates to go all in, so to speak, Texas Hold'em style, that's the time when the market has hit a peak and it's, it's over its skis. We don't know when that's gonna be, but we feel like, as a team, <clears throat> that the market is well overvalued. I'll give you a real quick example, one other quick example, the NASDAQ 100, um, five stocks comprise almost the entire value of the NASDAQ 100. And that's Apple, Microsoft, Google, and Facebook, uh, and Amazon. Those five stocks are almost 95% of the valuation of the, of the NASDAQ 100. That, that shows you the narrowness of the market. And so if any of those stocks have a hiccup, you know, the market just unwinds very, and it unwinds very quickly. So. I think you were maybe gonna talk about PE ratios. Thank you. So, you're giving a, a value, uh, an idea of PE ratios <clears throat> and sales. Amazon, which is one of the top value country uh, companies um, in the country, and the S and P has a PE ratio of about 80 to 85. That means you're paying 85 dollars of its 110 dollar approximate value for one dollar earnings. So, 110 dollars, you're getting about a buck 30 of earnings or so. Uh, Exxon Mobil, which has the same market price, about $110 per share, has a PE valuation of eight. So you're paying $8 uh, of the $110 a share to get $1 of earnings. So you're getting about $12 of earnings for the $110 you invest in Exxon. So Exxon is a much more valuable company, plus it pays a 4% dividend. So we are still of the opinion to have uh, value stocks that have low PE ratios that pay a really nice dividend where the current market is because you're getting paid something one, um, has better valuation two, and if the growth multiples uh, unwind, like we think they will because the consumer side spending, you gotta buy, you still gotta, everybody probably, unless a few people came here in an electric car today, everybody put gas in the car to come here, you don't have to shop on Amazon necessarily. You have other choices now. So we like companies like Exxon, right now as opposed to companies like Amazon, even though Amazon has had a nice run this year. So, so the next question is going to be for Michael, um, but along that, that thought, Todd talked about what we've done with our equity portfolio. So for those of you that, have, uh, that, that are clients, we, as you know, back in January of 2022, we completely overhauled client portfolios. So clients have 20 to 40 percent in uh, primarily large cap values like uh, stocks like Todd was talking about. Clients have 20 to 40 percent in um, either our high yield money market or short term treasury bills. And then clients have 20 to 40 percent in alternative investments. A big portion of that sleeve of alternative investments for our clients is um, private real estate. And so, Michael, can you talk a little bit about the state of the real estate markets and maybe also address the difference between private real estate and publicly traded REITs? Sure. Um, the, the real estate market clearly has been in the headlines lately. Um, 
uh, given pockets of dislocation, primarily commodity office. I think um, when when you think about real estate, it's really important not to, to paint it with a broad brush. Um, each sector has very different fundamentals. So within our fund, uh, we focus primarily on industrial uh, and residential properties. Uh, and, and our second strategy is real estate credit, which I'll come back to. Um, but within industrial, within residential, um, even through the, the recent slowness in the economy, the fundamentals in those sectors remain as strong as ever. Um, we're still seeing double-digit rental growth in most of our markets. And frankly, the inflation pressures that have come through have only uh, further constrained the, the supply side. There's really uh, two factors holding back new development. It costs a lot more, replacement costs has gone up, uh, and also the availability of financing for new development has been significantly impacted by the uh, withdrawal of the regional banking uh, sector. So, um, the, in some ways, despite the slowdown, the, the fundamentals in those sectors have actually improved in the last six to 12 months. Uh, and you can draw a, a, a comparison to that to uh, really what's catching all the headlines these days, which is commodity office. Uh, and uh, it's definitely the case uh, there's, there's going to be a, a, a fairly meaningful deleveraging cycle, and there's going to be a fairly meaningful shakeout of, of uh, a large volume of obsolete stock uh, that's uh, over levered and, and on bank balance sheets that's going to play out over the next couple of years of, of, of people needing to find solutions for that. So. Uh, I think that the critical piece of real estate is uh, you've got to pick your sectors and you've got to pick your markets. Uh, you can't look at real estate as a, as a general piece. And the other advantage we have in Crest is the ability to move in the capital structure. So um, really, when, uh, when the, the current rate increase cycle started, um, the, the equity market for um, private real estate became very dislocated. The availability of financing wasn't really there. Um, the bid-ask between buyers and sellers was, was, was very wide. It was very hard to transact, and, and transaction volumes uh, uh, declined significantly. Um, but at the same time, the, the credit markets became actually quite dislocated. The, the normal sources of capital for uh, financing uh, high-quality real estate, namely the CMBS market, the, the securitization, um, and, and to a lesser extent, the bank market really pulled back. And what that left is just a massive uh, gap in, in, uh, in, in, that, in that space. And um, what we started to see was some of the, frankly, some of the best risk reward opportunities we've seen uh, for real estate credit ever. We, we've been, since um, early 2022, uh, we've been deploying about 90% of our capital uh, to date into real estate credit. And what we're buying primarily uh, we're buying uh, loans through 65% LTV, so we've got a good 35, uh, 35 points of equity behind us to, to absorb the current volatility. Um, we're getting paid a 600 spread, uh, so in, in the current rate environment today, that's a double-digit cash return. Uh, and we're lending in sectors where the fundamentals are extremely strong still, industrial, multifamily, medical office. So um, so I think the, the punchline on on real estate, there's going to be a lot of noise um, in certain sectors, but uh, if you can pass through that and look at the sectors that are performing, there's, there's incredible values to them. And even in industrial and multifamily since April, uh, cap rates have, have expanded that 23%. Um, so these assets, which are still performing the same, are, are actually uh, significantly cheaper. So we think that's going to be a compelling opportunity going forward. Um, to the question on why are you doing a private REIT over a public REIT? Um, both are serving a function in the sense that uh, you're, you're both are giving you an opportunity to gain exposure to, a, to the commercial real estate asset class generally, which is a hard, as I mentioned before, a hard asset class to, to gain that direct exposure to. I think for a public REIT, the trade-off really is uh, you, the, the benefit is you're getting daily liquidity. The, the trade-off is that the price of that of, of your security is very much driven by public market fundamentals or technicals. So uh, you, you pick up a lot of correlation just to public markets, and you can look at the extreme. In 2009, uh, the public REIT 
index peak to trough was that was down 77 percent and we we know fundamental property values did not decline by 77 percent in that in that period but even in the last 12 months public REITs have gone from trading at meaningful premiums of nav down to uh, dis currently trading at discounts of nav so uh, you inherit quite a lot of volatility in the swings, which you don't have in a private REIT. We, we trade at the fundamental value. Uh, it's a semi-liquid product, so you're, you've still got access to capital. It's not daily, but it's quarterly. There's a, there's a cap. Um, but the trade-off to that is uh, a lot lower volatility and, a lot, uh, and, and uh, effectively a greater linkage to the fundamental value of the property, which we think is important. I think the other important piece when you think about a private REIT like Crest um, public REITs tend to be single asset focused, they're internally managed by a, a small team that, that exclusively manages that capital base primarily. Um, with Crest, we're able to plug into a, a global investment platform like KKR. So we, we have 750 investment professionals, we manage half a trillion dollars uh, with dedicated macro resources and, and Crest at its scale could not could not justify all those resources. But by plugging into a platform like KKR allows us to deliver greater investment uh, acumen, <coughs> leverage that full platform, and also bundle up strategies like credit and equity across sectors in a way that's just very hard to do when you have a small focused team. Thank you. Um, this next question is for you, Laura. So in 2022, we saw traditional fixed income markets um, be yeah, very, very volatile. Um, when we meet with our clients, the investment report that we show them, there's a, Todd calls it the heart attack chart, um, and it shows um, the, the performance for the year or since inception of the S&P 500, of the US aggregate bond index, and then of the client's portfolio. And as we go back and we look at performance um, over you know, the past 18 months, Many clients, when they look at that chart, the the bond in, uh, index is actually the lowest line on the chart. And traditionally, when people think about fixed income, they think that bonds mean safe. They don't necessarily understand that it's not just collecting income, that there can be a lot of volatility in, um, in the valuation. And so that's one of the reasons that we like private credit over traditional fixed income markets. Um, we really like the, the income on them, and then um, we also you know, really like that they, they tend to be less volatile and are floating rate. So can you talk a little bit about, uh, maybe expand on that a little bit? Yes, absolutely, thank you. <clears throat> Those were fascinating stats too on, on public equities. That was incredible. Um, so, I guess when I, when I think about what was causing all of that volatility in the public credit markets, so a lot of it was centered in and around duration risk. So effectively, that is 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 sort of measuring the sensitivity of, of price and yield. And where interest rates were going up, you effectively have a lot of duration exposure. And why the private credit asset class performed better during that period is because we're a floating rate instrument and we could float up with interest rates. And so, you know, for the high yield bond market, for example, that traded down into the low 80s. Um, for the broadly syndicated loan market, which is a close cousin to the middle market, which we invest in as private credit, that traded down into the 90s. And you know we were talking about fundamentals. I don't know that you know those those sort of those changes in, in value were really fundamentally driven, and they're more so headline driven. And that is one of the virtues of being in a, a private asset class, whether private real estate or private credit. And I think the points you made were, were spot on around you know valuations. Is that we're not taking sort of the we're, we're not marking the positions based on you know, the whims of the market or the susceptibility of volatility in the market that is frankly not fundamental based. So first and foremost, you know, as, as Lexi was asking, you know, why did investors really like the space? Well, it was you know, effectively a, a safe haven from volatility. 
It was also duration neutral because the asset class is, is floating rate. And so when we think about folks that have that traditional 60-40 um, investment model, um, like 60% being in traditional fixed income, 40% or, or excuse me, um, the other portion invested in public equities, you know, they really, those types of portfolios really got hurt. And it's why we talk so much about considering alternatives, be that private real estate or private credit, is something to incorporate into your portfolio. I mentioned before the yield premium. So what does that mean? It effectively means that for our instruments, they're e-liquid. It's an e-liquid asset class in a semi-liquid wrapper but we need to get paid a premium and yield above what we could get in the public credit markets. And that's also one of the reasons it's made this asset class so attractive. So what are the numbers that I'm talking about? So if we were looking at early 2022 or the end of 2021, a directly originated middle market loan had somewhere between a six and 8% yield. When the Fed increased interest rates 10 times over the last 14 months, our yields today are around 12% for that same risk profile. So that's when we think about, so all the time we have investors that said um, in 2022, well, I don't know what's gonna happen, so I'm gonna sit in cash. We talked about a lot of activity within money markets. And you know, frankly, when I think about it, I, I think about the yield that folks missed out on during that period of 22, 2022, when they were in cash. Because in our asset class, as interest rates were going up, all the yields were going up. So the element says you know, that we are, all the valuations on all the positions in our portfolio are done by third party accredited independent valuation providers. Okay, so we have no influence over the marks. They're, they're independently valued. The aspect of being or having duration exposure, the aspect of having volatility, those are all things that we think about in, in trying to move away from some of the traditionals and really incorporate and consider um, allocations into alternatives. Um, now my next question, I'm, I'll let you respond first time, but I would love to get input from Laura and Michael as well. Um, this first half of the year, I, I think one of the biggest headlines we saw was the um, regional banking crisis and the fallout from uh, Silicon Valley Bank. Todd, can you talk a little bit about your thoughts on how you think that impacts uh, the markets and client portfolios, both in the short and the longer term? Yeah, the, 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 I guess let me back up and say our uh, government and the consumers and investors are really good about, are really bad about making mistakes, uh, sometimes really big mistakes. Then we're really good about not making the same mistake all over again, but we're really bad about making new mistakes. And <clears throat> I'll give you a quick example of on the banking crisis, what happened. So the last banking crisis was really caused in 2007, 2009, was caused by the mega cap banks, the Bank of Americas, the Wells Fargo's. Those banks uh, uh, expanded their balance sheet and lended money to uh, bad, essentially bad people. They were not doing the underwriting that Naveen did on a lot of their clients. They were, Bank of America, who doesn't have any branches here, was uh, loaning on uh, strip centers in Louisville that didn't have a presence here. You know, you had Australian REITs that were buying shopping centers in St. Louis. Um, and so people were just throwing money at stuff and they didn't really understand the local economy or the local presence. Uh, so when the mega cap banks kind of rolled over, it was, contag it was a contagion that went all the way to the banking system. Uh, you had companies like the investment bank like Dr. Stearns, Lehman Brothers again, was, that were doing a lot of investing that they shouldn't, they shouldn't have gotten into in the real estate markets. Um, even go back farther, um, just to give you an example of that, um, in 1990, when we had the Persian Gulf War, we had that recession, 10% unemployment, 
you know, slow down the economy. Um, that was really caused by the uh, tax law change in 1986, which changed the, the tax deductions on passive real estate uh, investments. So that didn't trigger, though, until the economy slowed down in the Persian Gulf War and oil prices spiked and everybody was worried about uh, World War III. So, um, so fast forward to what happened with Silicon Bank. Um, the mega cap banks are, are uh, regulated at a very high level, have more than surplus capital, and really struggle oftentimes to make money because they can't loan money out. Uh, when we were at Merrill Lynch, oftentimes we would bring a client in that was a very good client, had money, credit, brains. Um, it was a good product or a good situation to loan, and the bank was just like, oh, we, we just can't, we can't do that loan. We just can't do it. They could go across the street to a public stockyards or one of the regional banks and all day long they can't get the loan done. So fast forward to what was just said, those kind of uh, super regionals like a Silicon Valley Bank, like a Signature, like a First Republic, like a Pac West, they don't play by the same rules that the bigger banks play by. So, and they're not as regulated and looked over like the bigger banks are because they're not, they don't have the headline risk that the other banks have. So those banks, uh, they did, couldn't deploy their capital like we talked about earlier in lending because uh, they had so much money coming in. So they invested in uh, longer term bond portfolios, 10 year treasuries primarily. And when the treasury went from 68 basis points to three and a half, four percent last year, those, those portfolios went from a dollar on a dollar to like 80 cents, 75 cents on the dollar. So Laura was talking about market to market, the valuation of that portfolio was down. Well, it got out in their uh, earnings reports uh, that, hey, we have, they have a loss on paper on the portfolio. And investors or depositors are worried that their deposits were going to be safe, so they made a run on the bank. Um, this old-fashioned 1930s or 2007, 2009 run on the bank. And it really was the, the difference. I don't have it in my pocket right now because I uh, left it on the table. But what caused Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank to fail in a day was a smartphone. Because a, uh, I can't remember the guy's name, but it was a uh, VC person out in Silicon Valley that tweeted out that he was worried about Silicon Valley Bank's portfolios and their deposit base not being safe. And that was on a Wednesday afternoon. And by Thursday, the bank had $200 billion in deposits. And on Thursday, they had $45 billion worth of withdrawals request. The bank was seized on Friday morning by the FTSC. Um, and they had that next day, a hundred billion dollars for the deposits. So, I mean, no business can withstand that. Can withstand that. So, if the administration stepped in, again, we're really good about learning things, mistakes in the past. The administration was very smart. They went in and backstopped it because they didn't want that contagion to spread to the rest of the, the regional banks. It still did. First Republic got hit. Um, PacWest got hit. Several of the regional banks, uh, similar that had similar issues, got hit. Um, in addition to Silicon Valley Signature um, that went in the belly up that weekend. So what that has caused is it's caused a lot of fear about, you know, people have actually said to us, hey, is, is our money safe to Charles Schwab? Uh, because we were in the Charles Schwab where Cassidy was in the headlines a little bit for the same thing. Schwab has more than enough liquidity to handle the portfolios where they're off and uh, where they've done the same, same kind of factor as what happened with Silicon Valley. Um, but a lot of the other regional banks have the same issues. And so they've tightened up lending and the Fed has told them to tighten up lending. So again, another portion of slowing the economy down to my colleagues uh, up here's points that things are slowing down. Um, interesting thing about uh, I was, when Laura was talking about rates and lost opportunity in 2022, which is why we're coming back to clients and redeploying capital maybe in a different way now or investing in more real estate or more private equity or private debt. Last year at this time, money market rates were one percent or one and a quarter percent. Today we're five and five percent and accelerating maybe even higher than that. So the cost of holding that capital was severe last year. Um, an illustration of Michael's point about publicly traded but privately and privately traded valuations. I like to use the example of Prologis. Andrew and I will work on some stuff with uh, publicly traded REITs versus privately traded REITs. And Prologis is the largest institutional REIT uh, traded. Um, book value of Prologis about six weeks ago was $140 billion. 
the market cap, what the stocks were worth, was $110 billion. So the stock was trading at like a 23% discount to all the properties that they own. Well, property values haven't gone down 25%. Obviously, if the book value is $140 billion, but that's a value to add at some point in time when they add it back to the, porf the, the equity portfolio. But that's what the difference between the asset classes that Laura and Michael represent and what we've done is a lot more stable in pricing for you, the clients. So. Thank you. Do you all have any anything you want to add regarding the banking crisis? Sure. Yeah, I'd say just from a real estate perspective, um, it's going to have a very meaningful impact. The, the regional banks, um, uh, well, collectively, the banking sector historically has provided about forty percent of the debt capital to to the real estate sector, and uh, two thirds of that was concentrated in the regional banks. So that they were a very important source of capital. Uh, and most importantly to uh, smaller, institu uh, less institutional borrowers, um, that was really their primary source of capital. Uh, and also, uh, the regional banks played a pretty heavy role in development uh, and construction financing. Um, those banks are, are very much out on the, on the sidelines now. They're, um, they've, they've withdrawn. I think they're going to come, come under a lot more regulatory scrutiny, to Todd's point. Um, the, the failures that happened should have been avoided. They, this isn't the what they're undoing is almost the one of one of of regulatory risk. You measure duration risk. You, you do an interest rate shock. Uh, so how they got themselves into the situation is a little bit dumbfounding. Um, but it's going to take some time for them to to right size after this. I think they're going to be under a lot of pressure to to sort out their their book, get it back on side. Uh, in, a, in a more conservative fashion. And, and what that means for us uh, is a, a big source of capital is out of the market for real estate credit, which we can, we can step in and, and solve. Um, so I think that's an opportunity for us. I think as well, a, from a competition standpoint, it, it helps with the margin. I think, uh, as I mentioned, the, the, the parties that really rely on that source of capital uh, are gonna have a tougher time. Uh, larger, more institutional sponsors uh, we're able to access a, a wider breadth of finance, finance sources. We, we've got life companies, uh, we've got securitization markets, uh, where you really need the scale and the reputation to access those markets. So I think the market, at least until the, the banking sector recovers, is gonna, gonna favor the larger institutional sponsors as well. I'll make two quick comments. Are we okay on time? Everything? Okay, cool. great. All right. Um, so when I, you know, when we all were looking at the headlines in, in March of 23 around the banking turmoil, um, I was somewhat numb to it. And the, and the reason I was a little bit numb to it is because in the space that we invest, we're providing capital to established, mature, multi-generational businesses. In the platform that I support, we've been around for two decades. Uh, most of the businesses that we're providing capital to have been around for generations even before us. Um, and so when I when I, we saw all the headlines around SVB, Silicon Valley Bank, um, when we thought about like what was their investor and customer base, um, and they were largely startup, venture, incubator businesses. And there's a place for that, right? There are, there are businesses that need to get their start as well. Um, but for us, we just didn't have exposure to that part of the market. Um, but what I think the, the sort of, the, the second point I was gonna make is there's a bit of, um, for, for us, we look at this as a little bit of a, an opportunity is because as the banks were very highly regulated, as, as, as Todd pointed out, the, the larger banks are very highly regulated you know, coming out of the GFC, and um, now they're going to be even more regulated, all the banks, big and small, they're not gonna be able to provide capital to businesses. And this is why there is a need for all of us to exist, is to continue to support the real, the real economy and real sort of financing and capital needs, whether in real estate or within the middle market for, you know, uh, small private businesses that we provide capital to. So I think it will further, I think, raise awareness of private markets, companies that are operating in private markets and have capital and financing needs because 
where the banks completely retrenched or retreated from the space after the global financial crisis when they made their first mistake. Now, sort of this second wave, um, I think, will only create more opportunities for us, and that means more opportunities for investors here today to get access to private markets that, you know, frankly, have very, very attractive yield profiles. Great. So, for each of your respective areas of expertise, I would love to hear what you think some of the major risks are that investors should be cognizant of in, say, the next six to twelve months. Whoever would like to start, let me start, because I just spoke. Oh, there you go. There you go. Um, I, I mentioned it before, I think within real estate, um, that we're, we're going to keep going through a deleveraging cycle for some time, and, and, and there are going to be some sectors that uh, are going to see pain, I, I think. Um, commodity office is in the headlines today. It's not going away. There's a lot of product on bank's balance sheet that is going to need to find a solution. Um, there's frankly a lot of undercapitalized borrowers who, who are overextended, who, who have been uh, pushing the ball forward, hoping for a reduction in rates and, or, or some sort of relief that's, that's just not going to happen. So um, there's definitely going to be situations uh, that, that within real estate that um, uh, could get quite ugly from a dislocation standpoint, but I think that they're going to be very centered in sectors and they're going to be very uh, centered around certain types of borrowers. So what what I think we need to do is just be focused on the sectors that are important. And also, it highlights the importance of good sponsors structuring capital structures in a, in a way that, that can last through cycles and having, available, having the access to financing, because that's really what you need to be successful. All the players who, who haven't done that or the, their underwriting standards have been a little bit um, uh, chasing yield rather than the fundamentals, there's going to be a bit of a shake out there. Um, the risk obviously is contagion that, that comes from that. Um, I think frankly our view is that contagion's already happened. Um, you know, it's, it's in the headlines today. As I mentioned, uh, industrial properties are, are down in value material when fundamentals have improved and that just tells you that the overall uh, risk appetite for real estate sort of uh, being severely impacted by some of this noise, so there'll be some of that. It's not gonna. There's gonna be noise everywhere, but um, but I think it's a the, the, the important point is going to be dissecting where that noise is and making sure that you're, you're not in those sectors and you're you're picking the right sponsors and you've got the right capital structures. Okay, so risks. Um, I am I'm concerned about you know this this asset class private credit has certainly gotten a lot of attention over the last several years and with a lot of attention meaning folks that want to invest in this space there's been a lot of new entrants to the market meaning new managers hanging up a shingle and saying I do private credit um, I have concerns around a lot of the new managers in the space because they're just untested they haven't lived through multiple credit cycles and they haven't lived through you know, different Fed policy action. They haven't lived through a global financial crisis, haven't lived through a previous US debt downgrade in 2011, haven't lived through oil and gas crisis in 14 and 15, and all of the Fed expansion and, and uh, tapering along the way. So I, I do have concerns for some of the, the new managers in the space that just haven't, they haven't just frankly been tested. And they raised a lot of capital because everybody was really excited about this asset class. Um, and they deployed that capital, meaning they invested that capital into deals that I have fundamental concerns with, right? And, and you know, some of the points made is that, well, if, if, this, if these instruments were all floating rate, when they underwrote those deals, which means when they are evaluating which companies to lend or not lend to, they may have been making decisions based on a zero interest rate environment. We were in a 14 year, basically zero interest rate environment. And for the platform that I support at Nuveen, like we knew the music was gonna stop, right? And when we were underwriting our credits and companies that we were deciding whether or not to provide capital to, 
we were underwriting with the assumption that we would hit a Fed fund terminal rate, and that was something to the tune of about 5.5% to 6%, which we're there now. So my concerns around the space is that I want this asset class to become more of a household name. Everyone knows what a high yield bond is, right? This is a effectively a, a close cousin in a way. Um, I do want this asset class to become part of like the everyday vocabulary for investors. Um, so my concerns are around perhaps new managers that are not tested, that invested in deals that may not be right, either structured well or not fundamentally sound or businesses that don't have a need to exist. And what my concern is in all of this is that that is going to be what's on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. Um, those are my concerns, so I, you know, I don't want to see that happen to our, the, the peers and our sort of cohort, if you will, but those are my concerns around the asset class. It's, it's probably like investing in the, in the good times, but what do you do in the bad times? I think my biggest concern is, again, if we, we've talked about historical, and Laura went way back, and so did Michael, about different cycles. And, you know, again, I mentioned earlier that tax law change in 86 caused the SNL crisis uh, to be exposed in the war with the, uh, the U.S. and Iraq and the first Persian Gulf War and caused a major crisis in the commercial real estate market, which could be starting now with what's happening after the um, Silicon Valley bank crisis. Then you fast forward to 2000 to 2003, that was an, over, an asset bubble in the, the tech market. Um, you, know, you went from being diversified to giving a large cap growth, or giving a large cap to giving a large cap growth and just giving anything with a dot com or a growth name on the end of it. And we had a huge PE ratios and the market was well overvalued. And it came down and it got exacerbated by the terrorist attack in 9-11 and then the second version of Gulf War in 2003. So <clears throat> then fast forward to the financial crisis, um, you know, that was a debt level. We were, Americans were spending $1.40 uh, for every dollar they were taking in income. And we had a huge real estate bubble because the stock market had gone down in 2003. Well, real estate never goes down, right? Real estate never, ever, never goes down. Your house never goes down in value. It always goes up in value. Well, people learned that that's not the case. So this is the first time in our history that the government has printed $6 trillion for the cash and flooded into the system over an 18 month period. So that is the dumb attack that the last three that I just mentioned that the government and consumers and businesses rush to. Now, what is this gonna wash out? So I'm worried about what the other shoe is that's gonna fall. Um, what it, it caused, the market to go down last year, it caused the interest rates to accelerate, but um, when the yield curve, none of us mentioned it yet, but 100% of the time, 100% of the time, historically, when the yield curve inverts, like it is right now, where the 10-year treasury is at 340 or 350, and the 30-day treasury is at 5.6, 5.8, Andrew? Where is it? Yeah, almost 6%. 100% of the time, we have a recession. So, it's just how bad is that recession going to be? So I worry about, I don't think we're through this cycle, like a lot of people are saying that we're through this cycle. I think there's another shoe to fall, and I'm really worried about what that other shoe is going to be. And I don't mean to scare anybody here, because we're, we're trying to figure out what the other shoe is. But we think there is another, an, another downturn somewhere coming up in a recession uh, that will come out of this, um, or something bad will happen, and the Fed will have to continue to increase interest rates and, and kick us into a maybe a severe recession uh, or some kind of economic downturn. So we're worried about the unknown, I guess, what we don't know. So, Todd, you're always so pessimistic. <laughs> I'm, I'm glass half full. I mean, at the end of this, well, let me say that at the end of this, when we do, the other shoe does fall, there's going to be a ton of money to be made. And so we'll everybody in this room will be positioned to take advantage of that. And in the meantime, since we have invested you in things like this, which are more stable and do have long-term track record, records and aren't the newest and greatest fund that is promising to pay 17% interest or the real estate fund that's going out and investing in all these slick and fancy things, we, we've invested in uh, you know the steady, steady, slow, institutional grade, battle-tested, 
multi-generational investments that have a lot of talented people. So yeah, you might not be able to talk about how great it is if you're getting a 4% yield on KKR and it went up 2% last year and you made 6% at the country club or you know, on, at your vacation home. But that's a lot better conversation than you were down 20% because you were invested in some growth fund that you thought was gonna blow to the roof. So, so that's what I would say. Is that, is that better? Yes, that's right. better. <laughs> so we're gonna end with um, a lightning round of everyone's, uh, th the one thing that you're most excited about uh, for the rest of 2023. And then uh, if we have a little bit of time, I'll see if we have any questions from the audience. So what you're most excited about. And it's lightning, so that means. The year, the year, whatever happens, happens and it's over and we move into 2024 with a happy face. <laughs> okay. Um, right now, only the best and highest quality companies are able to transact in our market. Full stop. So what we're seeing is and what's available to invest in actually represents the best of the best. So as, as my colleague here said, that you know, some of the best vintages for our asset classes come out after a period of dislocation, we're there now, right? So again, to transact in our market, you have to be a, a very high quality business that has a, like, a need and a reason to exist and is recession resilient. So I'm very excited about the new deal flow that we're seeing in 2023. And, and for me, it's real estate credit. Uh, the thing continuing that we've been investing in the last 12 months, I think is only gonna get stronger. Um, the availability of credit's getting worse. The, the quality of assets that are coming to market now with sponsors just can no longer have an option but to, to, to seek a solution. Uh, I think we're gonna have a, a, a really uh, once in a lifetime opportunity to be financing the highest quality assets at outsized rates with, without not a lot of capital competition, which is just going to create amazing opportunities. Great. Thank you all. Uh, before we wrap things up, do I have any questions from the audience? Do you all have any reaction to the debt ceiling agreement which may go through today? Um, I mean, if it goes through, is the market going to react in a, in a positive fashion? Or? Are still a lot of caution. Well, it could be m multiple things. It could be like that the hangover special, like the party's over, so oh, that went away. So now all the anxiety is gone, and the market could roll over because of that. The one thing that I would say, just basic economic model, I don't think there was the massive spending cuts that the House Republicans wanted, but there are spending cuts and spending freezes. And if we go back to our basic, um, you know. Uh, gross national uh, GDP, you know, what the economy does, it's um, C plus I plus G, which is the government. So if the government freezes spending over the next two to three years, you know, that will be detrimental to, um, to GDP. And so that could slow the economy down, not right away, but eventually. So I think, I think we learned, and it was mentioned up here in 2011, that uh, we can't let the government default and we almost learned it again in 2014. So I was pretty sure they were going to come to an agreement. It was just a matter of, you know, like Janet Yellen even can we talk about this at meetings where like June 1st was the deadline, right? It was we were out of money June 1st. Then Janet Yellen comes out and goes, well, it's really June the 5th or maybe the 6th, even we'd have extraordinary measures. You know, they're not going to run out of money. They're going to give them the time to get it done. So I think it could be anticlimactic, is what I guess I would say, and the market could roll over because of it. Nothing additional to add on. I agree. I, I agree. I think the market right now is not. This is a, it feels like a groundhog day in terms of these discussions. I think uh, the risk of a, a default, I don't think anyone really is putting a huge weight on that as a real outcome. It's just sort of a political noise, and um, everyone understands the gravity of what would happen if they, they, they didn't get this result. So, um, you know. It, in my mind, it's almost the annual budget discussion rather than a debt ceiling discussion. That's good. I like that. Any other questions from the audience? Yeah. Um, and, and, and that's to you. Todd reads the Wall Street Journal and other conservative newspapers, and I read the New York Times. Uh, and the Times keeps talking in their business section about the glut 
of downtown real estate. The changes in the real estate market uh, as uh, corporations don't go back to uh, using the space that they, that they had before COVID. So my question is, well, and, and, and the Times says, and that will have a significant effect on the income of New York City and other places that depend on the real estate market. So my question, I think is a basic question is, so what happens to that real estate? Uh, it, it is a really good question. I, I think, I think clearly that comments really in regards to the office stock. And I think what's, right. what, what's clearly been happening in, in, in the last um, five years, but, but obviously COVID and, and the work from home trends clearly accelerated that, um, is uh, corporate users are doing two things. They're reducing their footprint, but they're also increasing their demand for modern, well amenitized and uh, environmentally friendly space. So if you look at the newer vintage um, uh, construction, there's been you know, 90, 90 million square feet of absorption in the last five years. If you look at the, the same metrics for commodity office, so let's say more than 30, 30 years old, um, there's been about 260 million um, uh, square feet of, of, of stock that's gone dark. So that's a lot of office space that really doesn't have a bid today. And New York, uh, it, it's incredible. Our office is in Hudson Yards, which is a relatively new complex. Um, we ran out of space and we could almost, we, we were struggling to find uh, space to lease in that, that area. That's how, how uh, in competition that is. If you go to Mid uh, Midtown uh, 40th, um, there's vacant buildings that they can't give away. And that's in the matter of a couple of blocks. So, to your point, what happens to those properties? Um, it's, it is an open question. There's a lot of developers looking at those, saying, can they convert them to multifamily? Can they convert them to hotels? Uh, we've looked at that. We don't think it makes sense yet. Um, the, the, the cost to do that really just doesn't work, at least where the prices are today. Um, so it, it's going to be a, a, an ugly question. I don't think there's an answer. There's going to be a lot of office stock, um, which Banks are going to have to take back. People are going to give back the keys because there isn't really a, a, a great use for. Uh, and then, in some ways, it can be the same as uh, you know, what we've seen with retail over the years, where uh, there's been some successful re repositioning of malls and things like. Um, but there's also just a lot of stock that sits vacant um, and, and hasn't found an alternative use, and, and that could well be the case for this very old vintage office. I will say that most of, uh, well, not most, all of the uh, private real estate funds that we hold in our client uh, clients' portfolios hold very, very little in terms of allocation to, to office. Um, so I think we are positioned in the right place there. Any other questions from the audience? All right. Well, thank you everyone for coming out um, to our seminar today.